now that we've agreed that we're going to come into our salah focusing on it, keeping it within the parameters of the salah, and we promised we would add a second layer, which is understanding the components, the statements, the actions, the mechanisms of salah, which we will do for the duration of the coming weeks, inshallah. And then we added a third layer, if you remember, which was the layer of huh? hope, huh? raja, to come into salah with a strong expectation that Allah will fill your hands with khair, hope. And then we added a fourth layer after that, which was the layer of khashya, huh? <coughs> to have awe and fear of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, and we elaborated upon that last week. This week, insha'Allah, we're going to add yet a fifth layer, then I will share with you what I believe is the greatest key to unlocking <coughs> the stores of khushu'a. Praying in an attentive state of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll leave that till the end. What is this station number five? This is a station, a maqam, that is all too familiar in the lives of Muslims and non-Muslims, by the way, as a concept. I would argue that it is perhaps the most noble of these stations that we're going to speak about in terms of your relationship with Allah. It is certainly a component that when you feel it and experience it, when you begin your salah, you will feel that your salah is sweeter than it was before, much more enjoyable than it was before, and even shorter than it was before. That is how it feels when you pray with this mentality that I'm going to share with you this evening, inshallah. This station or this maqam, this layer, is perhaps, arguably, the strongest driving force that we know as human beings that pushes us to do the things we do. And encourages us to make the sacrifices that we do. What is this noble station? What is this powerful engine? What is this mighty motor in the lives of human beings? I share with you some introductory words given by Imam Ibn al-Qayyim as he describes this noble station that you and I are to be familiar with the moment we say Allahu Akbar and we begin our salah. Imam Ibn al-Qayyim, he says in his book, Madarij al-Salikeen, he says, وَهِيَ الْمَنْزِلَةُ الَّتِي فِيهَا تَنَافَسَ الْمُتَنَافِسُونَ This is a station which the competitors have competed over. وَإِلَيْهَا شَخَصَ الْعَامِلُونَ And focusing their gaze on the station is the action of the workers. وَإِلَىٰ عِلْمِهَا شَمَّرَ السَّابِقُونَ And the forerunners strive to learn about the station. وَعَلَيْهَا تَفَانَ الْمُحِبُّونَ And in the station, the lovers of Allah annihilate themselves. وَفِي رَوْحِ نَسِيمِهَا and benefiting from the refreshing breeze of the station, the believers are revived. Allahu Akbar, what is the station? He says, After all, the station is the life of the hearts. And it's the nourishment of souls. And it is the coolness of eyes. He said, he says, and it is the life which whoever fails to experience it is to consider himself amongst the dead. La ilaha illallah. What is the station? What station could it be other than the maqam, the station of mahabbatullahi azza wa jalla, the loving of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Have you felt this before? Have you experienced it? To truly come into salah, yearning to stand before him. You miss him. You desire to stand before him and to call and to share with him your ambitions and to also share with him your anxieties and your injuries. Why? Not just because you need him. Yes, this is there. But because you love him, you miss him, and you want to stand before him in bowing and prostration. The station of mahabbatullahi azza wa jal. It is sad, I think, that a lot of us 
restrict our relationship with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu to a relationship of do's and don'ts. They feel that their ilaqa, their connection with Allah Almighty is purely a relationship of commandments and prohibitions. Carrot and stick, opportunities, threats, and that's it. Now, we don't deny that, like other sects who say, this is not what drives us. It is just the love of Allah that drives us. We say no. The fear of Allah drives us. And the hope in His reward drives us. But what is above this all is Muhabbatullah, the love of Allah. So if you were to say that hope and fear are the two wings of a bird that you need for a journey, then the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would be the head of that bird. La ilaha illallah. And when you say mahabba, yeah, we say we are worshippers of Allah. We are ubad of Allah Jalla Jalla. We worship Him. That's how we translate ibadah. Although ibadah, when you translate it into worship, you've stripped it from its goodness. You've stripped it from its essence. You say worship, you think bowing and prostrating Quran and matters that are just physical. Although at the core of the word ibadah is love. The name of your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a relationship called ibadah, worship. But ibadah at the core of it is love. And that is why if you were to create a hierarchy of love, ibadah would be at the top of that hierarchy. It would be at the peak of that pyramid. It's the very highest level of love till you love the object of love so much that you worship it. That is ibadah. And that is why Ibn Taymiyyah and others, when they looked at this hierarchy of love, they said it begins with something called al-ilaqa, a connection. When you get to know the beloved, there is conversation, communication, there is mutual gazing, staring, there is now a ilaqa, a connection. If that develops and it's compounded, it moves on to the next level of love, it becomes a sababa. Sababa, it now means a desire. It's when now your heart begins to turn towards the object of love, you begin to desire them. Sababa. Then if that continues to grow, it becomes something called gharam. Gharam, it means gripping passion. And that's why in the Arabic language we call the person in debt gharim. Gharim because he is gripped with debt. So the mughram, the one who has gharam, he has gripping passion. Then if that continues to grow, that becomes a ishq, which is en engulfing love, where you're now nearing the peripheries of obsession. It's getting a little bit unhealthy now. And then if that continues to grow, then you develop what they call a tatayyum. And a tatayyum, it means infatuation, enchantment, enslavement, or if you wish, it means ibadah, worship. So when you say, I am, I am a abd of Allah, a worshipper of Allah, it means I am obsessed with Allah Jalla Jalaluhu so much that I've decided to prostrate to Him. La ilaha illallah. So how dare you and I ever strip away the concept of love from your relationship and then reduce your salah to mechanical movements when it is primarily about your love of Allah Almighty that brought you to the masjid and therefore you bow before Him and you prostrate. Allahu Akbar. Mahabbatullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu, O you who believe, may yartadda minkum an deenihi, whoever of you turns back on his religion, fasawfa yati lahu biqawm, Allah will bring instead of you a new people. What are their characteristics? Yuhibbuhum, people whom Allah will love. Wa yuhibbuhum, wa yuhibbuhum, and people whom he will love. Yuhibbunahu, people who love Allah. Wa yuhibbuhum, and people whom Allah loves. Yani Allah loves. Allah loves certain people. 
And the feeling of love is something that is not unfamiliar to any one of us here. It's not one of those concepts that we need to now give a linguistic and technical definition of. It's just one of those things that, as the Arab, they say, وَهَلْ يَخْفَ الْقَمَرِ Is the moon unknown to anyone? Is the moon unknown to anyone? Similarly, when you say mahabba love, it's something we instinctively, we know inside of us, we've experienced it. You know the fluttering of the heart when you meet the object of love, or when news is given to you that he or she uh, is nearing your destination. Where the heart not only skips one beat or two, it skips several beats. Something that most people have experienced, that moment where it's almost as if you can hear your blood pulsating through your veins. When now you develop obsessive, intrusive levels of thinking about the object of love, this is mahabba. Why do I say all of this? Because Allah Jalla Jalaluhu said, speaking about us, insha'Allah, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Those who believe, they love Allah even more. Take all of those people whom you've loved before and you've experienced what I've just shared with you. Allah says, the believers, their love of Allah Almighty is even more. And that is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would yawn for this closeness and nearness and love of Allah. And he would say in his dua, وَأَسْأَلُكَ لَذَّةَ النَّظَرِ إِلَىٰ وَجْهِكَ I ask you, O oh Allah, to give me the sweetness of looking at your majestic face. وَالشَّوْقَ إِلَىٰ لِقَائِكَ And I ask you to give me the desire to meet you. Allahu Akbar. How beautiful were the words of the poet speaking about Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. He said, إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَّا لَا تُشَدُّ الرَّكَائِبُ وَمِنْكَ وَإِلَّا فَالْمُؤَمِّلُ خَائِبُ وَفِيكَ وَإِلَّا فَالْغَرَامُ مُضَيَّعُ وَعَنْكَ وَإِلَّا فَالْمُحَدِّثُ كَاذِبُ He says, to you, O oh Allah, otherwise every journey is wasted. And from you, O oh Allah, otherwise every aspiration is lost. And in you, O oh Allah, Otherwise, every love is in vain. And about you, O oh Allah, otherwise every conversation is a lie. La ilaha illallah. Subhanallah. Mahabba. The love of Allah Jalla Jalal. So no doubt, the love that you have for your spouse, that has its joy, that has its specialness and uniqueness. No doubt. And the love that you have for your children, that has its uniqueness as well. And the love that you have for your parents and the love that you have for your siblings, you, the love that you have for your righteous brothers and sisters in Islam, it has its joy and it has its sweetness. As for the love of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, this is of a different level altogether. It's on a different platform. The love of Allah Almighty is of a completely different depth. And so the question that poses itself here is, how does a person develop and foster this love of Allah if you feel that it is lacking in your life. The same question that we asked when we spoke about raja, hope. How do we develop it? And we gave some steps. And then we asked the question, how do we develop the fear of Allah Almighty? This was layer number four. And we <coughs> gave some steps. And now we asked the same question, how does a person develop and foster the love of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu? First of all, what, is the, what are the components that usually bring about love in our hearts? What are the things that usually cause us to fall in love with people or things to begin with? It's usually kind treatment, ihsan, or it's usually jamal, beauty. These are the two things. Ideally, if they come together, then the circle of love is complete. Take the first of them. Ihsan, kind treatment. The Arabs, they say, Jubilati nufusu ala hubbi man ahsana ilayha wa bughdi man asa'a ilayha. They attribute this to Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, but it is, cannot be attributed to him. But it's a wise statement. They say that souls are naturally inclined to love those who do good to them. And souls are inclined to hate those who are evil to them. You have a natural affinity towards those who are kind. Sometimes you find no way to justify your love for a person other than to say, they've just been so kind to me. 
They've given me so much. I have no choice but to love them. They have entered my heart without permission. Ihsan, someone who's choosing the finest names to call you by, choosing your, your, your favorite nicknames, remembering you during the occasions, and never forgetting you during your dark hours. This is a person you have to love, regardless of anything else. Then you ask the question, is there any kindness out there, any ihsan, any ni'mah, any favor, any blessing that cannot be traced back to Allah Jalla Jalalu? All of those human beings in your life who have played a role in making you happy and content and satisfied in every way, who was the overseer of all of that? Who was the facilitator of all of that? Who was the manager of all of that? Other than Allah Al-Mun'im, the, the bestower of favors, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So should he not be loved? La ilaha illallah wa ma bikum min ni'mah fa min Allah any favor that you may have it is from Allah Jalla Jalalu This is a law to be adored Ibrahim alayhi salam he said to his community Alladhi khalaqani fa huwa yahdin Allah is my Lord who created me and guides me Walladhi huwa yut'imuni wa yasqeen and he is the one who feeds me and gives me drink وَإِذَا مَرِطُّ فَهُوَ يَشْفِينَ And when I fall ill, it is he who cures me. وَالَّذِي يُمِيتُنِي ثُمَّ يُحْيِينَ And he's the one who causes me to die and will resurrect me on the day of judgment. وَالَّذِي أَطْمَعُ أَنْ يَغْفِرَ لِي خَطِيئَةِ يَوْمَ الدِّينَ And he is the one who I hope will forgive my sins on the day of judgment. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's favor upon you is such that and focus on this for a moment, and I will give it example. Allah's kindness upon you, dear brother, dear sister, is such that your involvement in acquiring your rizq, your provisions, your food, your drink, your money, your involvement in that is a short, minute involvement in a middle phase. And all of the steps before it and the steps after it were taken care of by someone else. They were taken care of by Allah. What does that mean? I'll give you an example. When you make your way to a shop to buy a loaf of bread, your responsibility, what's required of you, is simply to pull off that loaf of bread in its ready form and then eat it. It's a pleasurable experience that has been left to you. As for all of the phases leading up to that and the phases after that, Allah Almighty has taken care of it in ways that you couldn't have facilitated. How? You come into your local grocery store, you pick up a loaf of hovis, granary, whatever it may be that you eat, a loaf of bread, and remember at that moment, please just remember, that you were not the one who went to the farms and you planted the seeds for that wheat. You were not the one who inspired the heavens to bring down rain for that wheat. You are not the one who inspired the soil to accept the rain and to allow it to sink through, to nourish those seeds, nor were you the one who inspired those seeds to then produce wheat. You were not the one who then harvested the wheat. You didn't grind the wheat. You didn't uh, mix the components, the ingredients together thereafter. You didn't do any of that. You didn't knead the dough to make that bread. You didn't break, bake the bread, the bread. You didn't package the bread. You didn't transfer logistics, the bread, from where it was to the, to the suppliers and put it on the shelf. You did none of that. All you did was remove it from the shelf. And then after you've eaten it and you've enjoyed it, you are not the one who uh, inspired that bolus of food in your, in your throat to now go down through your esophagus. You are not the one who inspired the esophagus to start contracting from top to bottom in order to bring down that food to your stomach. You didn't do any of that. Who thought of that? You were not the one who inspired your epiglottis at the back of your throat to snap shut, to prevent that food from going into your air pipe, your trachea, instead of your food pipe. You didn't do any of that. You were not the one who inspired your stomach now to start moving and churning to digest the food. And you weren't the one who inspired your stomach to start producing those complex enzymes to break down the food. You were not the one administering managing the digestive process that involves your liver and your gallbladder and your stomach and your pancreas. 
harmonious, miraculous, complex process. You didn't do any of that. And then you played no role in the transfer of that digested food into molecules from your stomach into your bloodstream. And then the eventual and proportional transfer of those molecules to every part of your body. A bit of that food in the form of energy goes to your nails. Some of it goes to your eye, the white of your eye, your cornea, your hair, your skin, your muscles, your tendons, your, your nerves. Allahu Akbar. Who was the one who managed all of this? And then in the end, when your body has taken the goodness of that food and it's now ready to release the waste that it doesn't need, what part of that process do you manage? Allahu Akbar. And that is why I said to you that your involvement in acquiring your rizq, your provisions, is only a short involvement in the middle. Everything else has been taken care of. And that's just an example pertaining to bread, not other food. Or other drinks. Your salary, we can give the exact same analogy. The doctor who came and gave you a medicine, we can give the exact same analogy. Allahu Akbar. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا Allah said, if you were to try to count the favors of Allah, you could never enumerate them. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ لَظَلُومٌ كَفَّارٌ But man, by his nature, he is unjust. And he is ungrateful. So a Lord of this kindness, is he not to be loved, dear brothers, dear sisters? And that is why... Uh, yeah. I love the words of Imam Ibn al-Qayyim again, who said in praise of Allah Jalla Jalaluhu, he said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a haqquman humid, the worthiest of all of those who are praised. He said, وَهُوَ أَنصَرُ مَنِ ابْتُغِي And he is the greatest victor of all those who are sought for help. وَأَرْأَفُ مَنْ مَلَكُ And he is the gentlest of all kings. وَأَجْوَدُ مَنْ سُئِلْ And he is the most generous of those who are asked. وَأَوْسَعُ مَنْ أَعْطَى And he is the most vast in how he gives. وَأَرْحَمُ مَنْ اسْتُرْحِمْ And he is the most merciful of those who show mercy. وَأَجْوَدُ مَنْ قُصِدْ And the most generous of those who are retreated to. He said, وَأَعَزُ مَنْ الْتُجِئَ إِلَيْهِ And he is the mightiest of all refuges. وَأَكْفَى مَنْ تُوُكِّلَ عَلَيْهِ And he is the most sufficing of all of those who are relied upon. And then he says, وَأَرْحَمُ مِنَ الْوَالِدَةِ وَأَرْحَمُ بِعَبْدِهِ مِنَ الْوَالِدَةِ بِوَلَدِهَا And he has more mercy for his creation than the mercy of a mother for her child. And then he gives you the last one. He said, Subhanallah. He said, وَأَشَدُّ فَرَحًا بِتَوْبَةِ التَّائِبِ مِنَ الْفَاقِدِ لِرَاحِلَتِهِ التي عليها طعامه وشرابه بأرض مهلكة حتى إذا أيس منها ثم وجدها and he said Allah is happier with a person who repents after sin than a person who is on a long arid barren desert lifeless and all he has with him is his camel that is carrying his food and drink when all of a sudden he loses the camel and he despairs of life and he finds a tree, he rests under it, waiting for death to die in this excruciating, agonizing pain. And then all of a sudden he finds that camel looking over him and he has found his life yet again. Allah's happiness for a Muslim who repents is greater than that person. This is a law to be adored, la ilaha illallah. Furthermore, the more people do good to you, the more you should love him. Because you remember that they are mere facilitators and the source is Allah Jalla Jalalu. Therefore, when people do good to you, that should not cause you to forget Allah. It should cause you to love Allah more. Otherwise, you will be like that person who uh, has a postman knocking on his door and he gives him a gift sent to him by a sender. And he showers praise and gratitude and thanks to the postman. And he forgets who? He forgets the sender. That doesn't make any sense. Likewise, you and I, we are postmen to one another. Your employer who drops your salary at the end of the month, that's just a postman on behalf of someone else. The doctor who so kindly comes and gives you your medicine, that's just a postman. The person who builds your house, the person who <coughs> marries your daughter, the person who gives you children, whoever they may be, any happiness or joy that you find in your life on a day-to-day -day basis, these are all postmen. 
who deserve thanks. We show gratitude to the creation, but never at the expense of the sender, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the more uh, everyday experiences that you go through, when khair comes your way, goodness, that increases your love for Allah, al-mun'im, the giver of favors, the source of all khair. So we said, number one, one of the ways in which we foster love for people is through what? Through ihsan, kind treatment, good treatment. And we've just established that all of it is from Allah Jalla Jalla. So is he not deserving of love? Come into your salah with that. We said the second thing that usually brings about love in our hearts is what? <coughs> what was the word that we used? Huh? Huh? Beauty, huh? jamal. Again, our hearts are naturally dispositioned to uh, love those things that are pleasing to the eye. That's something you simply cannot help. And that thing could be quite rotten at its core. And some of them are human beings as well. But a lot of people, they still remained enchanted by that person. Why? Because of the physical outer splendor of that individual. We see it all of the time at the Islamic Council of Europe. You see a couple who are together without mentioning the genders, right? But one spouse is absolutely obsessed with the other. Now you're thinking, why? There is no religion, there's no salah, there's no akhlaq, and there's no nothing. And then you realize, and he's putting up, uh, I, gave, I gave away the gender. He is putting up with all of the trash that's coming his way. It could be the other way around as well, her way. And you think, why? What is the maslaha? What is the benefit here? What are you getting out of this? And you read between the lines, this person is simply enslaved because of the outer splendor of their spouse or at least how they see them. So Allah created this that way. And then you ask yourself the question, what is more perfect in beauty than Allah Jalla Jalaluhu al Jamil, the source of all beauty? The more you see beauty around you, the more this should direct you back to the source of it all, Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Can there be anything more beautiful than him? And that is a reality that people will only realize when the veils of light and the veils of fire are removed between Allah Almighty and his creation. And he will reveal himself to them once and for all. For them to cast a long and blinkless glance at the face of the majestic subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the moment they forget the rivers of Jannah and the hoor of Jannah, the palaces and gold and silver of Jannah as they stare at the face of their creator subhanallah once and for all. There you will see the Al-Jameel, the source of all beauty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a Lord, therefore, to be loved. And that is why Imam ibn al-Qayyim, he said, وَأَمَّا جَمَالُ الرَّبِّ تَبَارَكَ وَتَعَالَى وَمَا هُوَ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ الْحُسْنِ وَالْجَمَالِ وَالْكَمَالِ فَأَمْرٌ لَا يُدْرِكُهُ غَيْرُهُ وَلَا يَعْلَمُهُ سِوَاهُ He said, as for the reality of the beauty of the divine Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, and the perfection of his splendor, that is something that is only known to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and no one else. La ilaha illallah. What do we know about the beauty of our Lord, Jalla Jalaluhu? The beauty of his that, the beauty of his divine essence, the beauty of himself as a Lord. Allah says, Allahu nuru samawati wal Allah is the light of the heavens and the earth. And it is a light that shall illuminate the plane of resurrection on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah when Allah Jalla Jalaluhu will arrive after many years of standing to finally settle the scores and to begin the reckoning between creation. Allah said, وَأَشْرَقَتِ الْأَرْضُ بِنُورِ رَبِّهَا The land on the day of judgment will shine with the light of its Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he would say in his dua, وَأَعُوذُ بِنُورِ وَجْهِكَ الَّذِي أَشْرَقَتْ لَهُ الظُّلُمَاتِ وَصَلُحَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْرُ الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ I seek refuge in the light of your face that has dispelled all darkness, O oh Allah. A light that has corrected the affairs of this life and the hereafter. This is the beauty of Allah Jalla Jalala. And we... As human beings today, we don't have the faculties installed of us in this version of our humanity to receive the beauty of Allah. Plain and simple, if Allah had removed the veil between you and I, 
and him subhanahu wa ta'ala, we would die there and then. This version of the human body doesn't have the features, the faculties, the software and the hardware needed to comprehend and to accept and to absorb the beauty of Allah Almighty. That is something, of course, that will change on the Day of Judgment, where you will see him without any middleman and with no veil, and you will be able to take it, but not in the life of this world. And that was a lesson that Prophet Musa والسلام, had to learn the hard way. Allah said, When Musa finally arrived to the appointed time to speak with us, this was in Tur, Mount Sinai in Egypt. He said, my Lord, allow me to see you. Speaking with Allah and hearing his voice moved Prophet Musa into passion. I now need to see my Allah Jalla Jalalu. Rabbi, my Lord, arini anzur ilayk, show me. Let me see you. Allah said to him, lan tarani, you will not see me, meaning in the life of this world. Walakin anzur ila al-jabal, but look to the mountain. فَإِنِ اسْتَقَرَّ مَكَانَهُ فَسَوْفَ تَرَانِي If it stays where it is, then you will be able to see me. So he looked at the mountain as Allah instructed him to do so. Allah said, فَلَمَّا تَجَلَّى رَبُّهُ لِلْجَبَلِ And when Allah manifested himself to the mountain, جَعَلَهُ دَكَّا The mountain crumbled. The mountain was decked into dust. Imagine that sight. And we've recently just come out of a horrific earthquake in northern uh, Syria and south Turkey. Subhanallah. So we're familiar with type of, this type of destruction. He saw the mountain crumbling before him. وَخَرَّ مُوسَى صَعِيقًا Allah said, Musa passed out. He lost his consciousness. فَلَمَّا أَفَاقَ So when he regained his consciousness, قَالَ سُبْحَانَكَ Glory be to you. تُبْتُ إِلَيْكَ I repent to you. وَأَنَا أَوَّلُ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ And I am the first of the believers. So this was the reaction of Prophet Musa when he saw something that saw part of Allah. Did you get that sentence? This is what happened to Musa alayhi salatu wasalam when he saw something, a mountain that saw part of Allah Jalla Jalalu. So we don't have that faculty today. On Yawm Al-Qiyamah that will change. And we will see the majestic face of Allah, insha'Allah. So Allah is Jameel. Allah is beautiful, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ibn al-Qayyim, he says, وَيَكْفِي فِي جَمَالِهِ أَنَّ كُلَّ جَمَالٍ فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ وَفِي الظَّاهِرِ وَالْبَاطِنِ فَمِنْ آثَارِ صَنْعِهِ وَخَلْقِهِ وَجَمَالِهِ فَكَيْفَ بِمَنْ صَدَرَ عَنْهُ هَذَا الْجَمَالِ Subhanallah. He said, it is enough to know that every beauty out there, whether in the life of this world or in the hereafter, or whether it's a, hid a hidden inward dimension of beauty or a public outward dimension of beauty, all of it, he says, are from the effects of the beauty of Allah Almighty and His creation. He said, so what then do you make of the beauty of the source of it all? This is the point we mentioned earlier. Every time you see a dimension of beauty, whether it's a country, a mountain, a river, a sea, a landscape, an animal, an insect, the cosmos, you think to yourself, Allahu Akbar, if this is the beauty of the creation, what about the creator? When you travel the world and you see something like the Grand Canyon of Arizona, it's hypnotic in its beauty and its size and its majesty. And the Colorado River that is flowing beneath it. Subhanallah, who created that? And what then of the beauty of its maker, subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or you go to the Zimbabwe and Zambia, Victoria waterfalls, take a look and see why the locals call it this, the, 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 the cloud or the, the cloud that thunders or the water that thunders or the, the, the smoke that thunders. Amazing. Or whether you go to Africa and you visit those enchanting ecosystems of Kenya and you see those endless stretches of golden grassland going all the way into the horizons, la ilaha illallah only ever to be interrupted by these graceful acacia trees and rumbling wild animals and elephants and zebras. You say, la ilaha illallah, what about the beauty of the creator? Subhanallah, it's phenomenal. 
whether you see the, uh, the National Park in Canada, maybe you've seen it, it's called Banff, inshallah, I'll be visiting it this year. The National Park of Canada called Banff, take a look there and see its 10 peaks and its hot, uh, its hot steams, its hot springs, miracle. Or a little bit closer to home, here in, the, in Scotland, go northwards and see the highlands there and what Allah has created there, la ilaha illallah. All of these are signatures, signatures and signs of the majestic and the perfect Allah Jalla Jalla. What then of the beauty of the maker of it all? Same thing with animals. You can do the exact same exercise. Look at the white Bengal tiger. Such a beautiful animal. Subhanallah, an animal of power, strength. It's, it's grand when you look at it, dominating in its appearance. Clearly designed by a wise and beautiful creator. Even an animal like the, uh, the, the, the peacock, an arrogant animal, because it knows just how beautiful it is when it opens up its, its feathers and it just shows off its colors. It's a miracle, Allahu Akbar. It literally walks arrogantly. It walks with a strut, the billionaire's walk. That's how the peacock walks. It's beautiful and it knows it. Or the, what they call the Frisian horse. Maybe you've seen the Frisian horse, solid black, jet black, an act, a, a design of beauty. Hypnotic again, miraculous, elegant. Who was the creator of all of that? Then the same exercise for the under, underwater experience. And see what Allah has created there. Then go out into the cosmos and see the systems and the, and the patterns there that Allah Almighty has created that continues to baffle scientists till this day. Who was the designer of all of that? Then you ask yourself, what then of the beauty of the designer and the maker of all of that? SubhanAllah. So we mentioned that there are uh, two things that usually bring about the love of people to your heart, and that is ihsan, kind treatment. We've shown that Allah is the source of all of that. And then we said beauty is another one of those things that we are so inclined to, and Allah Jalla Jalaluhu is the source of all of that. <coughs> and then take a very quick tour around some of his majestic names, and tell me, is this not a Lord to be adored? He has called himself Al Ghafur, the ever forgiving. Who else do you know who is willing to forgive a lifetime's worth of sin and crime in exchange for a single moment of true apology to him other than Allah? Who can do that but Al Ghafur, the forgiving, who never tires from forgiving till man stops repenting? He is a forgiving Lord. He calls himself Al-Halim, the forbearing. Who do you know who is more patient than Allah Jalla Jalalu? No one is more patient towards abuse that is hurled at him than our Lord Allah Jalla Jalalu. They ascribe partners to him. And they are atheists, they disbelieve in his existence. And those who do, they are neglectful towards his ibadah, yet he continues to provide for them and feed them and gives them the air that they need to inhale and he gives them the limbs that they need to disobey him and they disobey him using the apparatus that he gifted them with and he continues to wait for them to turn back who does that other than a lord who is halim forbearing a lord of clemency and then he calls himself al-wadud meaning the loving you and i if someone does wrong to us we may forgive them after some time and after some itab Right? But if you are able to start loving them again, that's if it takes a long time for us to regain the trust and love after we've been let down. You love them, but from a distance a little bit further than what it was before. As for Allah, Al Wadud, the loving, He forgives, He erases sins, He replaces them into good deeds, and He loves you after your sin from a place that was nearer to you than before. That is Allah, Al Wadud. And then he is a satir, or pronounced as satir, two pronunciations, meaning the one who conceals, the one who veils you from your sins, who doesn't take you away from the moment you disobey him to embarrass you in front of your family, your children, your neighbors, and your community. He veils and veils for a year, for 10, for 50, in the hope that one day you will turn back. Who does that other than Allah? And he is a latif, the subtle. Meaning he is the one who sends you the things that you need in your life in such subtle and discreet ways that you don't even realize it. 
Allahu latifun bihibadihi la ilaha illallah. Is this not a law to be loved? Now, why have I mentioned all of this? All of this is to share with you one hadith. All of what you heard is simply paving the way to take us to this next hadith that I wanted to share with you, which is what? فَإِذَا صَلَّيْتُمْ The hadith which At-Tirmidhi narrates on the authority of Al-Harith Al-Ash'ari The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that Zakariya Alayhi Salatu Wasallam said to his community of Bani Israel, the Muslims He said to them, فَإِذَا صَلَّيْتُمْ When you stand up in prayer فَلَا تَلْتَفِتُوا Don't look around. Why? He said, فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ يَنْصِبُ وَجْهَهُ لِوَجْهِ عَبْدِهِ إِذَا صَلَّى Because Allah positions his majestic face in the direction of the face of the worshipper when he prays. Allahu Akbar. That Lord that we have just described, who we should have all this hope in, and all of this fear in, and all of this love in, or love for, he positions his majestic face towards the face of the worshipper. When he says Allahu Akbar and he begins his salah, he says, so don't look around. Because the moment you do that, Allah Almighty changes the circumstance. So come into your salah, my dear brother, my dear sister, in summary of all of what you just heard today, with an intense feeling of love. You miss him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you're standing before one whom you need and you want and you yearn for. And watch how that on its own will transform your salah.